Hey everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Um, thanks for coming to my talk. I know it's really early in the morning and I'm really sorry that I missed both of your talks because I think what you're, the work that you're doing is, is really, really amazing and um, look forward to hearing more about it later. So I'm going to give a, a tactic talk about the, the garden that I built in the tower over there and I just want to say one caveat at the beginning that this garden was like, it's, it's not just my project, it was like lots of people that contributed to it. Um, and I have some acknowledgements at the end for those people. So, uh, my approach in general, uh, the things I do, I make things, make things better, and in this case, make things worse. So that's kind of what the garden is about. It's not, it's not a project about like, how we use plants to remediate pollution in soil. These are the guiding questions that I came into this project. Go ahead. Um, how does nature strike back as a form of civil disobedience? How can we apprentice to nature and implement its tactics as a form of direct action? So to sort of begin, if truth is concrete, then what do we do about this? This is Caprinus commodus. It's a type of mushroom that can grow through roads. And there's also plants that can do this. This is the tree of heaven. Uh, in German, it's called gutterbaum. But maybe this is a really simplistic way at looking at biological disobedience. The inspiration for this project was from a group called the Critical Art Ensemble, who wrote this essay, Fuzzy Biological Sabotage. And in it, there's a, a bunch of different theories that they're working with. Um, the main one is about sort of how to align with nature to create inertia in the capitalist system. And here's a quote from, from their essay, which I highly recommend reading. Um, inertia will always disturb a society of speed. Assuming that inertia is always useful in disturbing capitalist production and distribution, one must ask, how this principle can be applied to the current molecular invasion. And they were specifically focused on the biotechnology industry. So what the garden is, is it's a space for trying to take their theories and put them into practice. Because I think that there's a whole, like it's a whole different kind of animal to have an idea, but to actually make it happen is a whole other thing. And this space is also, it's like kind of like the next step from theory into practice and then after this step would be implementation. So I'm not like going to go out in the world and like inoculate r freeways with these mushrooms during, during this marathon. But I'm more interested in having discussions about like how would we get these mushrooms to grow through roads. So for example, to talk a little bit more about, the, about fuzzy biological sabotage, one thing that the CAE recommends or suggests in their theory is to release mutated fruit flies into biotechnology labs that are doing, ge doing genetic testing on fruit flies to try to screw up their tests. So this is a, a kit that I ordered um, to grow these mutated fruit flies in the garden because it's sort of like, this is a great idea, but how the heck do you even culture mutated fruit flies? And I'm, I'm particularly excited about the, the relaxing jar. I don't know if you guys can see that at the bottom, but I like that idea. So here's an image of the kit. And on, on Tuesday in the garden at, at 3 o'clock, we'll be culturing these fruit flies. And you're more than welcome to, to come in and, and join. And, and we can all learn how to do it together. Um, so to bring it back to this concept of inertia. So what their suggestion was, was to grow these fruit flies go into biotechnology research labs, into the lobbies and release them, or into parked cars in the parking garage, or into local businesses. And they would land on the, the laboratory technicians that were going into the labs. And then once the technicians were in the labs, these fruit flies would fly all over and infect, infect their tests. And what they advocated for was, uh, or in the essay, is a consistent dose of fuzzy biological sabotage. Meaning it's not about quantity. It's not about going in and releasing tons and tons and tons of these fruit flies and it's like a, you know, a one-hit wonder and their tests are screwed up. It's about going in on a consistent basis 
So consistently, their tests keep getting screwed up and they start thinking like, what's going on? Like, why are our tests screwed up? We can't figure it out. We're doing everything right. Maybe somebody in the office is, is like sabotaging our tests. Maybe, you know, and all these questions would appear and there would be a sense of par paranoia and fear and that's where the inertia comes into the system. I guess, does that make sense to everyone? Or should I explain it more? No response. <laughs> so the next species I wanted to talk about is the crazy raspberry ant. And it's named after the exterminator that discovered this species um, that's now invasive in the state of Texas. And these ants infest electronics. This is, they infest electronics and then short circuits the, the systems. And there's recently been a chemical company that's closed in Texas because it was infested by these ants. And there's also, I think that the question about this with the ants is like, it's really amazing, right? That they're doing this. But the, another question is like putting theory into practice, like how would we do this in a calculated manner? If we wanted to, for example, infest oil industry headquarters or other sorts of things that run on systems, the Department of Defense with these ants. How do you do it in a calculated ma manner and how do you do it in a way that you don't get caught and imprisoned for being a bioterrorist? And so that's one of the interesting things as well about the CAE's article. Fuzzy biological sabotage. Fuzzy meaning this line between legality and illegality. And I would also argue that it's a line between ethics and unethics. So, for example, like what would be the ethics of releasing these ants into computer systems where they're going to die, but maybe you bring down, I don't know, some, some source of exploitation for the earth. And then I want to give like a sense to you guys that there's lots of different species. It's not just sort of these like silver bullet species. So, for example, in this page we've got uh, the Pacific Coast termite, which of course eats wood but could eat things like wooden buildings as well as there's, um, there was recently in India, there were like millions of rupees that were eaten in a bank in India by the termite. And there's silverfish and carpet beetles and things like that that do similar things. And sort of my question is like, I've been involved with a lot of protests where let's say you're like protesting British Petroleum and everybody walks there with their, uh, you know, everybody walks there chanting signs with placards, maybe like spilling some black paint on the ground to symbolize oil spills. But what would happen if, if like bed bugs were released in the streets and went into the buildings and then the whole headquarters had to shut down because of an infestation? But I think also like, again, what is this line between like ethics and unethics and, and, and terrorism and, and legality? So another element of the garden is thinking about plants that are resistant to pesticides. Um, I'm specifically interested in the pesticide Roundup, which is made by Monsanto. So these are a series of different species, chamomile, radishes, sunflowers, amaranth, morning glories. They're all resistant to this pesticide. Inside the garden, I'm going to, starting on Monday, I'm going to be testing the different levels of resistance of these plants. Um, there's different scientists that have been studying them and I've sort of collated their lists and tried to find as many species as I could. And then the next step would be thinking, once we figure out like which plants are more resistant than others, trying to figure out ways of dispersing seeds in fields. And again, looking at these points of leverage in the system, like going, figuring out where Monsanto's testing sites are and releasing these seeds in those fields, maybe through seed bombs, maybe through seed kites. I'm, I'm curious about a discussion about how it could be done. But essentially, if, if, they're testing dif if they're testing their chemicals on these fields and you're releasing these weed seeds in the fields and their, their chemicals aren't working, then not only it screws up their tests, but it maybe possibly also delegitimizes using pesticides and delegitimizes using GMO crops as a viable solution. And just to clarify, the way that GMO crops work that Monsanto makes is there, the genes are changed so that they're resistant to this chemical Roundup. And then when the chemical is sprayed, any plant that isn't genetically modified dies, except for these plants which are naturally resistant. 
Another element of the garden is bacteria. Um, I've been working with a local scientist here um, who's been studying Stenotroph monas, which is a xenotrophic bacteria, which means that it, uh, it's a bacteria that lives in the roots of plants and it can digest really intense chemicals like the pesticide Roundup. It can also, it can also digest arsenic, uh, dynamite, uh, cocaine, and what it does is it lives in the roots of plants. This is like an electronic scanning, scanning microscope image of the bacteria which is red in the roots of the plants. And it digests these chemicals so it can actually improve the resistance of these chemicals or of, these, of the plants to chemicals like Roundup. And here's a, a computer generated model for how it's living within the root systems of plants. So this isn't bacteria that's on the plants. It's actually living within the plants. And there's a whole discussion in the field of science right now about the microbiome, about all of these fungi and protozoa and bacteria that live within our bodies. Just like I'm sure a lot of people have heard about all the bacteria that live within our digestive systems. And it turns out there's a theory right now in science that the bacteria doesn't just live within our digestive system, lives throughout our entire bodies. And our bodies are more bacteria than they are us. But the bacteria provide the essential functions for doing things. Like for example, I was meeting with the scientist Gabrielle Berg and she told me that there's a bacteria, you know how you guys, you, you get strawberries, those big strawberries that don't taste like anything? She was telling me the reason that those strawberries don't taste like anything is because they're industrial farmed and the bacteria isn't present within the plants that creates, a, uh, that digests a specific nutrient and creates the strawberry flavor. So it's actually the bacteria that creates the strawberry flavor. But this can be, can be, can go both ways. So what the GMO industry is working on right now is inoculating their fields with this bacteria so the strawberries will now have the strawberry flavor but they can keep farming in the same exploitative way. So sort of like these bacteria could be used to improve the resistance of plants to GMO crops and chemicals or it could be used the exact opposite way to like further dupe us. Also in the garden there's a few different types of pathogenic bacteria which possibly could be released on genetically modified crops to kill the crops. And then maybe the last section we'll look at uh, our little friend Disulfo vibrio vulgaris. This is an image of, of D. vulgaris and this is where it lives in the tar sands in, in Alberta, Canada. Um, and as I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the tar sands but it's a huge area of oil exploitation that's extremely energy intensive and if the proposed expansion of the tar sands goes through the earth's temperature will rise two degrees celsius alone from the oil from the oil extraction and the oil that's going to be found in that area so what is what does divulgaris do it grows on the surface of of metal oil pipelines oil drills oil derricks and it forms a bio a biofilm that corrodes the metal so this is the kind of thing that happens so the oil industry in the tar sands is struggling with this right now I met with a scientist uh, on on Saturday about this and he said what the plans what the oil industry is trying to do right now is inject the oil wells with where, the, where this bacteria is present with antibiotics to kill this bacteria but I'm interested in this bacteria because what would happen if you started to go to sites of oil exploitation and were releasing this bacteria or putting it in the oil well but again this is an issue of like how do you put theory into practice and so, so here's some images of some different tests that have been run on, on metal on pipelines to see how it's been corroding the pipelines. And then the last thing I wanted to do was just thank the different, was just to thank the different people that helped out with, uh, with the garden. So again, the inspiration from the Critical Art Ensemble, the Lab of Insurrectionary Imagination were the people that put this essay into, into my hands, as well as Richard Hugas, Louis Bassett, Tim Ratcliffe, and Arthur Van, Van Balen. Annika Strasmier has grown all the mushrooms, as she's part of Steyrshire Herbst. 
that, uh, that's in the garden as well as helped with the production. And Ram Labor did the design and building. Um, Ushi Bosch helped me scavenge plants from the plants that are in there, the Roundup resistant plants from uh, fields in the airport as well as uh, just around town in sidewalk cracks. She's been amazing. Gabrielle Berg, who cultured the bacteria, she'll be here on Thursday at 3 o'clock to, to give a talk in the garden about xenotrophic bacteria. So if you want to come and ask more questions. And then Richard Hugas also helped with a lot of the drawings that are in the garden. Oh. And, and then on Wednesday, we're going to make hot pepper smoke bombs. So if you want to come, it's at 3 o'clock. Thank you so much, Catherine. Are there questions? <clears throat> so I know that this is in the, because you're in the kind of thinking part of this, you know, before the putting into practice. But um, I guess what I was thinking about is like, do you, have you been thinking about the element of this that could be beyond your control? I don't mean that as a criticism, but because you're also intervening, you know, in the natural environment, like, do you, have you thought about or are you talking about like the ways in which this part, you know, some of these tactics could be, you know, beyond everyone's control and what that would totally mean, yeah. Like if you were to like release an invasive species. Right. Like what are the, and I think that that, the, I hope the garden is a great space for coming in and having discussions about that. Like yeah. where, like again, it's this like notion of the fuzziness. Like where is the line yeah. between like this is going to have a good impact and then it's going to have a, a horrible neg negative impact. And also like it's a, s a similar line, not just with species, but is the, if this like theory or technology gets into the wrong hands, what kind of thing happens with that? You know, like if it gets into the hands of the Department of Defense. That's a really good question. No more questions? Um, just that you were talking mostly about, I mean, this kind of like practical, uh, physical, like kind of like experimental work you're doing with, you know, chemicals and biological testing kind of. And I just wondered how much of it was also specifically addressing the kind of like um, these legal loopholes that you talked about. Like how much of the project is also about oh. that? Yeah, that's a really good point. I haven't taken that much into consideration yet, but that's a really good point. Like it would be interesting to research like if you wanted to infest an oil company's headquarters with termites, where is the legal line? Like if you release the termites into the, in the street and they on their own accord go into the building, when is it, when are you implicated and when are you not? Like when is, mm. like a termite can't be, can't be convicted of trespassing, but maybe the person who releases them can be convicted of bioterrorism. And I feel like there's maybe a different line between like if you went into a building or if you were in the street or if you like sprinkled pheromones and then it was like a mile away. That would be interesting. It'd be interesting to talk to a lawyer about that. Does that address your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I kept thinking when you were talking, but wouldn't you get in trouble? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but I think like that's one of the really clever things that that the CAE is talking about with yeah. the fruit flies. Is it's like nobody would know if but you're just like very incognito going into these laboratories and releasing them. It's not like it's not like you're going in and these like crazy outfits or something and doing this like. I don't know, flash, flash mob type thing. It's just like no one would ever know. But is it mostly that or is there actually these kind of like um, specific like legal lacunae that you can kind of like exploit? These kind of like, um, like is it, mo is it more about uh, like, well, I'm not going to get caught or is it more like, well, actually I can do this? Totally. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a really good point. Like where are the loopholes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would be interested in looking, that, looking into that further. If you want to come and talk about it in the garden, that'd be awesome. Hi, uh, I have a question about if uh, no one knows, for example, that I'm thinking about this oil spills and this bacteria that create leaks in the pipelines. 
no one knows that it was because of putting the bacteria there that it happened. So it looks more like a natural disaster. Um, um, how much would it really help when no one knows that it, it is because of people dissenting? Or well, I'd, I wouldn't necessarily advocate for putting the bacteria on the pipelines. I would advocate for putting the bacteria on the drills and the derricks so that they can't even drill for oil in the first place. But as far as that goes, I'm not, I'm not super interested in like PR and media. Like I'm actually interested in creating real substantial damage. Like for example, like if, a, if an oil company can't pipe their oil into our cars, that's like, that's like, that's more successful to me than like a media report that's like, these activists went and put this bacteria on the pipeline and now the pipelines, you know, like I'm actually like interested in, in trying to like essentially throw a, like a living wrench into the gears of the system. Okay, but isn't there the inertia that they gonna panic because that's true. everyone is gonna put them on their, on their pipelines or on their drills or something. So the yeah. media would help to uh, make the paranoia or inflate Maybe. the paranoia. I feel like the media is a really, I don't know, I feel like the media is a really like double-edged sword. You know what I mean? Like it's a tool of the system and it's like a question to me about like using these tools of the system. It's also a question to me of like using science because I feel like science, like Western reductionist science is highly problematic. But I feel like, to me right now, I feel like so much activism is geared towards the media. It's geared towards like how it's, how it's photographed, how it's filmed, how it's relayed, things like that. But I guess you might not even be talking about the media. You might be talking about like putting out on a website and claiming that this was done in, in such way. Yeah, it was more about how, how the event will be interpreted and what, what consequences people take out of it, like when it happens. What do you think? Uh, it was for me, uh, it's, um, uh, it's a question, so. Uh, yeah, I think it's a really good question. So can I ask you, so in terms of the fact that you're in researching these abilities and the capabilities, potentially, and then that is a threat, isn't it? That kind of, the fact that you have, or potentially will have, the knowledge to be able to spread this bacteria to, like, pipelines and stuff. First of all, it is a threat to those companies and to anyone, really. And how are you able to then, like I think someone just spoke about, is there going to be something that is like a switch off? Or is that bacteria potentially going to spread to anywhere? If it's like in bread or kind of released in such a way and it's got all of that metal, if it eats metal to eat, it's going to kind of go out of control. It used to say that you're not going to put, like yeah. destroy literally the planet by releasing it. Like the, is it augmented this bacteria or is it just already existing? In this? It's already that bacteria I was talking about is already existent yeah. in in the oil in the in the tar sands, yeah. and so that oil companies are already having to deal with this. But you're right that it would be a really big problem if I, if it was released and yeah. then suddenly it was like all over all over buildings and hospitals and children's schools. Yeah. But if you were releasing it in a place like the tar sands or a place like Anwar where there's no other metal around, like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in, in where they're about to start drilling in Alaska. Maybe that's a better site for it. So it's a really good question and a really good point to bring up. It's sort of quite alarming that that's, if, if you're doing that, then there's other people going to be doing that. So then there's that, that sort of sense of threat from that sort of research, isn't there? I think that there's total threat, but I think there's also like a huge threat right now of the way that we're exploiting the earth. And I think that I don't propose this as like the solution and like the tactic we can take. I propose it as like one thing that we could consider. And so, you know, maybe there's circumstances where it would make sense to use it and maybe there's circumstances when it, when it won't. But I guess like I, I'm just like really searching for ways to like step it up a notch and really start speaking truth to power and like and taking action rather than just like kind of I feel like we're still in this state where we're like kind of allowing these things to happen. 
Yeah. But there's something interesting about the fact that if you, it, it reminds me slightly of the Cold War, mm. that if there's a threat of use of something so catastrophically bad from something that is opposing the so the so-called system, mm -hmm. then you're sort of like no one ever really releases their sort of mm. major mm -hmm. epic threat. They just have the idea and the notion of that threat. Mm -hmm. it's sort of this sort of weird psychological game mm -hmm. in a way. And in the way that you're talking about it, it's like this is something I could do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like this sort of quite a threatening position to take. And if that if it was reported by the media in that kind of way, mm -hmm. then it would be there would be this kind of structure of threat from it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, that's really interesting. The logic I'm hearing is that given, given the uncertainty of, of uh, the activist control over this bio-intervention, is that, uh, which, which is, sounds like it is a concern, it's a question that you're, you're inviting us to discuss and debate. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the anger I hear and the anxiety I hear from you about whether it's GMO or, or the oil industry, um, a, a more precisely targeted act of inertia creation is just good old fashioned explosives. Mm -hmm. I don't understand exactly why that vague, fuzzy approach using, using plant life and bacteria is, is is the one to go for, except in the circumstances where you don't want to be known to be doing it. You're effectively just nudging nature on a bit. Mm -hmm. But in doing so, you're, you're, it's, it's that fear of it just being absolutely out of control and therefore counterproductive, mm -hmm. gobbling up hospitals and children's schools and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a, what is not clear to me is the extent to which you actually are an activist, in which case any strategy is, is, is appropriate if it's a good one, or whether you're an artist playing with something, unclear quite what those implications might be should somebody pursue them. Mm. Seems a bit confused to me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have it figured out by all means. <laughs> Yes, so uh, my question has already been asked, so I wanted to ask about this control. I think it's a really important question and I think it's a little bit, um, uh, sorry to say, but it's a little bit naive uh, to say that, okay, we can spread it somewhere uh, on some terrain belonging to an old company and uh, uh, I think I can very easily imagine that someone takes it in his bag accidentally to some hospital or something, so it's... I think it's a crucial question for you. Yeah. If maybe maybe it's possible to develop some ways to control this bacteria. Yeah. So you always have uh, something to control it if you want to spread it. Maybe that's a solution. But still, I, I think it's uh, it's a really important issue. Mm -hmm. Thanks for those thoughts. <laughs>